following program is sponsored by CBN. Coming up, diagnosis, cancer. And it was inoperable and it was a very large. Prognosis, grim. Is there an option? I didn't know if we were going to be planning goodbyes. And the insurance company rejects her last shot. They don't care if I live or die. (laughs) What are we going to do now? Watch an incredible answer to prayer. Exactly the prayer that I had prayed that the tumor fell out of my body. On today's 700 Club. Well, welcome to the 700 Club. 100 meters. That's as far as people are now allowed to venture from inside their homes in the nation of Israel. It's a drastic measure in the two-front war that Israel's prime minister is facing, the global pandemic and political crisis. Chris Mitchell reports from Jerusalem. In the war against the coronavirus, checkpoints are becoming part of life for Israelis. We want people to stay at home. We don't want people to go out unless absolutely necessary. And therefore, based on the new laws and orders, people will only be allowed to leave their houses until 100 meters. The new regulations forbid employees from coming to work with a temperature more than 38 degrees Celsius or 100 degrees Fahrenheit all non-essential shopping, and trips to public parks and playgrounds. Now I'm going home and I'm uh, not intending to coming out till, uh, till the government say it will be okay. Police also closed Jerusalem's iconic open-air market, Mahane Yehuda, and Muslim authorities have closed the Temple Mount indefinitely. Trips are allowed to the grocery store, the doctors, and pharmacies. Prime Minister Netanyahu invoked the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 4, and pleaded with Israelis to obey. I say this as clearly as possible. You must stay home. Stay home. Stay alive. The danger lurks for everyone. Take good heed of yourselves. While Israel battles the coronavirus pandemic, it appears unlikely that Benny Gantz's opposition Blue and White Party will join a national unity emergency government with Benjamin Netanyahu and his Likud party. On Wednesday, the Speaker of the Knesset, Yuli Edelstein, dropped a political bombshell when he resigned. Edelstein's critics charge he refused to open the Knesset to stop legislation that would disqualify Netanyahu from becoming prime minister again in a new government. Those bills have the support of the Blue and White Party and the Arab Joint List. As Israel's political deadlock remains unbroken, Netanyahu rallied the nation by reminding them of the Passover story from the Bible. The exodus from Egypt reminds us that our people have withstood fierce storms. This gives strength. This gives hope. We survived Pharaoh, and though the battle will be hard and uncompromising, we will also survive Corona, with God's help and with yours, citizens of Israel. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Uh, CBN Middle East Bureau Chief Chris Mitchell joins us now in Jerusalem. Uh, Chris, what in the world is going on in Israel? You know, the Bible says a house divided can't stand, a kingdom divided against itself can't stand. Are they ever going to get together? Uh, That's a great great point, uh, Pat. And first of all, I just want to wish you a happy belated birthday. I've just celebrated 31 years with you. We've done a lot here in Israel. We've been up in the Second Lebanon War on the the front lines there of that war. And I just wanted to speak for the whole Jerusalem Bureau. It's our privilege to serve with you over here. So as you say, and as the Jewish people say, may you live to 120 just like Moses. Well, as you say, a house divided against itself. Go ahead. As you say, a house divided against itself cannot stand. Pat, I would say there's two viruses over here, the coronavirus that the whole nation is fighting and an anti-BB virus that is right now uh, infecting the political landscape. Uh, It seems like the Blue and White Party, at least some elements of the Blue and White Party, want to do everything they can to eliminate BB Netanyahu from being the next prime minister. So uh, that is what's happening here right now. The fight against the coronavirus, which... Benjamin Netanyahu is really doing a a serious, emphatic job of of, uh, uh, just telling Israelis not to go outside. This is a disaster in the making if you don't obey these rules. So so these are the two dynamics going on right now, Pat. 
Well, you know, I haven't understood there was a big uh, outbreak of coronavirus in Israel. Is they, are, they, are they just uh, being proactive? Well, no, there's about over 2,500 uh, have been uh, contracted the coronavirus, about eight deaths, but that's climbing by the day, sometimes by the hour. So they are implementing these restrictions to, to make sure that Israel doesn't become Italy, doesn't become Spain, and uh, they're doing everything they can to, to sort of get a ho ahead of that curve that Dr. Fauci keeps talking about in the United States, and they're doing what they can. They don't want the healthcare system here overwhelmed. It's already about 100% in the best of times, so, uh, so they want to do what they can to prevent what's happening in these other countries happening here in Israel. Uh, last question, uh, will Israel, Israel, Betanayu, uh, uh, the blue and white, will they ever get together for the good of the nation? You would hope so, Pat, but it seems unlikely right now. Anything can happen in Israeli politics, but uh, it does seem unlikely. It seems like all the appeals that Netanyahu has been having to have an emergency government has gone unheeded by the blue and right or the Arab joint list, and so they want to do what they can. Two quick points, uh, Pat. In the midst of this, uh, there's some of the nations are actually accusing the Jews of the coronavirus. That goes back historically when they accused the Jews during the Black Plague in the Middle Ages. That's happening on the bright side. Believe it or not, Jews are coming back here to, uh, to make Aliyah in the midst of this pandemic. And that's the prophecy fulfilled by all the Hebrew prophets. So they're still coming, the Jews, back to the promised land in the midst of this pandemic. Great word. And yes, we're going to be like Moses, 120. I appreciate that good word. And the work you guys are doing from Jerusalem is outstanding. Thank you so much. Well, Thanks, Pat. In other news... The economic fallout from COVID-19 has begun. 3.3 million people are applying for unemployment. 3.3 million. Ephraim Graham has more. Pat, that is a record high number of unemployment applications. Many fears it's just the beginning, but there's promise of relief. Congress is on track to pass a $2.2 trillion aid package, not just for corporations. It includes small businesses and families as well. Heather Sell shows us when the checks are expected to arrive. Late Wednesday, the Senate passed the $2 trillion relief bill aimed at helping both families and businesses recover from the pandemic. On this vote, the yeas are 96, the nays are zero, the 60 vote, vote threshold having been achieved, the bill is passed. The president tweeting, congratulations, America. The bill now goes to the House, which is expected to vote on it Friday. The relief package would have the government sending direct aid to individuals. People earning $75,000 or less would receive a $1,200 check plus $500 per child. At a daily coronavirus task force briefing, CBN White House correspondent Ben Kennedy asked the president how soon the relief might come. We are hearing you are pushing for April 6th to have direct payments issued to taxpayers. Is that the target date? I think it's uh, Again, I, very much I, I would say our expectation is within three weeks, we will have direct payments out where we have depository information. And uh, we're looking to get a lot more information and we have procedures to do that. So three weeks for that. And I would say the end of next week, we want all the banks to be able to originate loans same day. The president says he would like to reopen the country by April 12th, Easter. But his medical experts say that may or may not work. You've got to understand that you don't make the timeline. The virus makes the timeline. U.S. deaths from the virus have now topped 1,000. With the number of cases doubling every three days, there's still enormous concern about having enough hospital beds. An estimated 5% of the sick need ICU beds. It feels like you're getting beat up all the time. And then the coughing you know, becomes pretty violent, just exasperates the pain that you feel in your body. One month after Mardi Gras, Louisiana has the third highest rate per capita in the U.S. New York is still the biggest coronavirus hotspot, and the state is scrambling to get enough ventilators to handle a surge in patients. But the governor says he's encouraged that the rate of hospitalization in the city is slowing slightly. This is uh, a very good sign and a positive sign. Again, 
I, I'm uh, not 100 percent sure it holds. Still, FEMA expects the state's 1,800 intensive care units will be full by Friday. Heather Sells, CBN News. As coronavirus cases surge and the death toll passes 1,000, Americans are paying close attention to updates from the president's task force. Response coordinator Dr. Deborah Burks has become a trusted presidential advisor. CBN's Jenna Browder talked to her about navigating the response to this pandemic. Dr. Deborah Burks is the response coordinator for the U.S. Coronavirus Task Force, and this is not the Army Colonel's first pandemic. The U.S. Global AIDS coordinator for 65 countries since 2014. Burke says the spread of COVID-19 in the U.S. depends on how Americans act in the next few days. The next five to six days is absolutely critical. Warning the clock is ticking. Dr. Burks is hopeful Americans will heed the White House recommendations of 15 days to slow the spread. It is absolutely critical that Americans continue to follow the federal government's guidelines. So important about social distancing, non-essential travel, and hand washing. Now a familiar face in the must-see White House briefings, Burks put her own adherence to those guidelines on display this week. You'll notice I was not here over the weekend. I think this is the part that we really need to take personal responsibility for. Saturday, I had a little low-grade fever. Uh -oh. <laughs> so, actually, probably a GI thing. But, you know, I'm meticulous. I'm a physician. I looked it up. I ended up piggy bank. I'm from Walter Reed, so I got a test late Saturday night, and I'm negative. I stayed home another day just to, <laughs> Thank just, you for saying that. Yeah, just to make sure. That's how we protect one another. Burke says the president's reaction to the virus behind the camera is substantially less tongue-in-cheek. He's been so attentive to the scientific literature and the details and the data. And I think his, his ability to analyze and integrate data that comes out of his long history in business has really been a real benefit during these discussions about medical issues. That attention to data may be what led the president to drop an Easter bombshell when he expressed hope about getting the U.S. economy back up and running. What do you say about Easter services? Is that too soon? The United States is a big country, and community by community is different, county by county is different. And so we are now looking at all of the information that comes in from testing sites, whether they're hospitals or drive throughs at the community level. And this will give us some real insight into into where there is really almost no COVID virus and those communities can really work on containment. What do I mean by that? When you find someone that's positive, you put them in quarantine, you contact trace, there are still counties that can do that. Reopening shuttered businesses in large metro areas like New York carries a different risk than more rural states. These decisions will need to be highly tailored in a granular and laser focused way to ensure we continue to protect those that we know have the most serious illness. Burks, who has worked on the front lines of the AIDS epidemic, serving at Walter Reed and the CDC, says that stopping the spread begins at the community level. The faith community is very active within their local communities. Dr. Burks, what's your direct message to them during this pandemic? The faith community has really critical role to play in community and community, community after community, both giving out accurate information and important information, but also ensuring that everyone in the household feels part and engaged in their community, even though they're in their homes themselves. Dr. Burks has seen, quote, unbelievable acts of kindness in her career and hopes this pandemic will change the way we greet each other using words that show we care from at least six feet away. In Washington, Jenna Browder, CBN News. She leads by example. Pat. Joining us now is psychiatrist Daniel Amen. He helped develop the Daniel Plan, a program to get the world healthy through churches. He's also the author of the now best-selling book, The End of Mental Illness. And doctor, this week, President Trump said he's concerned about people committing suicide because of the economic fallout. What do you think about that? It's absolutely true. Um, calls to suicide hotlines have now gone up over 300 percent. So that means three times before um, people are Googling um, 
anxiety, depression, panic attacks, uh, way more than before. This is stressful for our whole nation. You know, I was watching the ABC News last night, and I, I tell you, if, if a program was calculated to put fear in the hearts of people, they succeeded beautifully. They had all these young, uh, strong people dying. Uh, did, is the mental health, have we reached a crisis level, do you think? Well, I think people need to turn off the news, you know, maybe look at it two or three times a day for 20 minutes. Otherwise, you're exactly right. They're um, geared to scare you and put fear in you when there is a lot of good still going around. Now, I often say mental hygiene is just as important as washing your hands. We have to also disinfect our thoughts so that they don't ruin our immune system. Well, now, just talk about that. Is, you, you, this is, is, you use the term psychosomatic, but the soul, the mind is c controlling the body in this case. I mean, you can get sick because of your mind. Uh, no question. Whenever you have a negative thought, a fearful thought, an anxious thought, an angry thought, your brain releases chemicals that make you feel bad, that actually can decrease the effectiveness of your immune system. But whenever you have a happy thought, a hopeful thought, a grateful thought, it strengthens your body. I went to Oral Roberts University and they taught us about these four circles. You know, you have to understand someone's biology. You need to wash your hands. But you also have to understand their psychology, how they think. I talk about killing the ants, the automatic negative thoughts that steal your happiness. But there's also a social circle who do you hang out with? And now we were socially isolated, but we don't have to be totally isolated. We can be talking to people over the phone, over FaceTime and so on. And then what a lot of psychiatrists never talk about is there's a spiritual circle, which is why do you care? What's your deepest sense of meaning and purpose? Staying well means we address all four of those circles. How do you explain this to little children? You tell children the truth. Uh, I have a very anxious grandson. And when people weren't talking to him, he actually got worse. And when they started to explain in language that he could understand, he actually calmed down and became part of the solution. And that's what children really want. They want to feel safe, but they also want to feel competent. They want to help by and large. Well, doctor, thank you so much for that excellent advice. We appreciate your writing and what you have to say. Dr. Amen, tremendous guy. Well, I want to give you a verse for today, so you want to write it down or put it in your memory. It's from the book of the prophet Nahum, Nahum, N-A-H-U-M, Nahum, 1-7. Here's what it says. The Lord is good, a refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust in him. I want to read that to you again. The Lord is good, a refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust in him. And I, I want you to know that God Almighty says, because ye, they have set their love upon me, therefore I will protect them. I want you to get that in your heart. Because you've set your love upon him, I will protect you. Fear not. The Bible says over and over again, fear not, do not fear. And uh, just keep in your mind that the Lord God of hosts is on your side. And he is more powerful than any bug, any virus, any contagion, any plague, any war, any depression, any of these things. God Almighty is in charge. Do not fear, because the Lord will look after those who trust him. Terry? Well, that's really shown in this next story. Coming up, a 10-pound tumor. Doctors said it would cause organ failure and death. And the worst part, they said it was inoperable. So how is this woman alive to tell her story? You'll find out after this.
A 10 pound tumor wrapped around her kidney and the prognosis, organ failure leading to death. That's what worship leader Rebecca Bischel was facing as a young wife and mother. Still, Rebecca was believing for a miracle. What exactly did she pray and how did she receive a precise answer to that prayer? Take a look. The surgeon came out and laid the news on us that it was a cancer wrapped around my kidney and it was inoperable and it was very large. As worship leaders in Phoenix, Arizona, Rebecca and Brad Bischel know to trust God in all things. But when Rebecca was diagnosed with an inoperable tumor, their faith was put to the test. Inoperable is not a word you want to hear. Um, I think it kind of immediately means chemo, radiation, if there's anything at all as an option, or is there an option? I didn't know if we were going to be planning goodbyes or if I was going to start a heavy treatment. That first drive home, that was where I probably dealt with that the strongest. Like, what is what does this mean? What does this look like? Is this a, like, how long do we have? In the middle of all the unknowns, they pressed into their faith and prayer to sustain them. I put my hand on my belly every day and I would say God caused the tumor to shrivel up and fall out of my body. I wanted to build my faith, but at the same time, I also wanted to rest and trust in His goodness and sovereignty, even if I didn't see that happen. And that was difficult. That was very difficult because I had to come to a place where I could truly say in my heart that I trusted God with no matter what happened. And even if that meant ultimately, I'd leave my kids and my husband uh, from earth. <laughs> Rebecca was diagnosed with a rare cancer called liposarcoma. Her prognosis was not good. The 10-pound tumor would eventually cause organ failure and lead to death. They decided to get a second opinion. The original report said it was inoperable, but the doctor came in the next morning and said it was operable. We had some contact with another doctor who recommended that we go to MD Anderson in Houston. and. They also verified that it was operable, but that they were the only ones that needed to be doing the surgery. God's plans are always better than ours, so if that meant we were supposed to be in Phoenix, then he would very clearly shut the doors to Houston. And I remember a moment of just being mindful of that, like, okay, we want to do this, <laughs> but at the end of the day, like, we want to go where God wants us to be because that's the purpose and the plan. The couple just released an album and planned to be on tour. Despite the unknown future for Rebecca, they decided to praise God through their concerts. We would be in a concert with a congregation of people, watching people worship with us and knowing that they had stories way worse than mine. But yet there they stood and they were choosing to lift their hands and lift their voices and sing about the goodness and love of God. And that was so encouraging to me, like they were leading me in worship. In the middle of this chaos, we got to be with some of our amazing church families across the country singing and worshiping. Now these songs were just massively impacting our hearts. And we're looking at these lyrics in a whole new way and declaring these truths that we needed more than anything else. As they prepared to have surgery in Houston, their insurance denied their claim to go to MD Anderson. I was really scared. I was really afraid because I just felt like my insurance company isn't, they don't care. They don't care if I live or die. <laughs> what are we gonna do now? Brad and Rebecca kept praying. Then out of nowhere, the insurance company changed their decision and decided to cover the surgery and even pay for their travel. Another sign of God just coming in and changing changing the story, and that caused us to, you know, we have the report of man, but then God comes in and He gives His report. And the Word says we're supposed to believe the report of the Lord and trust in that, and He's going to trump anything <laughs> that has to be said because He's able. The day finally came for Rebecca's surgery. They were told it would take six hours, but just two and a half hours later, the surgeon came out to meet with Brad and Rebecca's parents. And I see the surgeon, which in a there's like this immediate like 
why is the surgeon out? <laughs> the surgeon isn't supposed to be here right now. And she says, well, we're all done. Uh, we got her on the table, we opened her up, and the tumor practically fell out of her body. When they came in and said that the tumor practically fell out of my body, I was just like, oh, that was a miracle from, from my heart, <laughs> just that I needed to know. Because he used the words, he put them through the, the surgeon's mouth to say exactly the prayer that I had prayed, that the tumor fell out of my body. Rebecca's follow-up scans show that she is still cancer-free, and the Bishels rejoice. I knew that God was saying to me, He heard my prayer, and that even the moments that I felt like I didn't know where He was, and I didn't know if He was going to heal me, and I didn't know if He was going to answer my prayer, that, that He was with me, so closely with me that He knew, and He was listening to my words, and He was answering me through the surgeon's words. We've seen God do amazing things year after year after year. Not all of them massive and big, some of them very small and almost insignificant unless you're looking for what God has done. But we can look back and see those things. And that's what I would encourage anybody to do. Look back and see what God has done. Look how he's worked in spite of a circumstance. And look how he's done it in a way that is clearly his plan and not ours. And then be able to trust that the situation you're walking through now, he can handle. You know, one of the great reasons to look back and remember the things that God has done is because it strengthens your faith for today. That's what we want this story that you just watched to do, to strengthen your faith before we all pray together for what God will do in your own life. We've got some amazing reports yeah. here before us. Oh, Pat, yeah. this is yeah. Janet. She's from Eastland, Texas. A year ago, she was diagnosed with arthritis in her hip. She suffered immensely and tried to make the best of it. One day while watching this program, she heard you declare healing for, quote, somebody who has arthritis in their leg. So by faith, Janet put her hand on a large knot and she felt burning from her hip all the way down to her ankle. Since praying with Pat, the knot and the arthritis are gone. She can walk more and sit in a chair without pain. On her next visit, the doctor said, there is no more arthritis in your leg. I tell you, that's a miracle. That is a uh, miracle. Uh, arthritis just doesn't, go doesn't go away unless away. God that's did That's right. All right. Bruce, who lives in Clayton, North Carolina, was in bad shape. His left leg was in extreme pain to the point where he could no longer walk. Bruce watched the 700 Club and Terry said, touch your left leg and affirmed that God was healing at that moment. God touched, uh, Bruce touched his leg and was completely healed. Folks, we have these reports coming in all the time because God Almighty is able. Look, if he could create you. Now listen, there's some people who say, well, I really don't believe in healing. Well, do you believe in salvation? Yeah, I believe in salvation. And what do you think is going to happen in salvation? Well, my dead body, which has been put in the grave, is going to come back together, and God's going to give it a brand new body. Oh, you believe that? Yeah. But you don't believe that God can fix your broken leg. Yeah, that's right. God can do anything. If we believe Him for the great thing, He's going to resurrect us in the day of, of His coming. We certainly can believe Him now for healing. Now, what have you got? Is it cancer? Is it scoliosis? Is it arthritis? Is it blood disease? Is it something else? We're going to pray and we're going to believe God for you. Now, this is the day of miracles, right this day. Now, Terry and I are going to join hands together despite all these restrictions. <laughs> and we're going to believe God. Father, in Jesus' name. This, uh, God's doing a miracle for Lucia. And it's a miracle taking place. You've got an infection in your blood, and God is, is cleansing that infection. The virus or whatever it is in your body is going away right now, and you are completely healed. Terry? Uh, there's someone, you're a young person. I'm not sure of your age, but you've had a head injury, and because of that, you wear this kind of helmet. Maybe you've even had surgery, and it's protecting that part of your cranium or something, but God's healing that condition for you. Whatever the issue is, no matter how long, how deep you've had it, it is gone in Jesus' name. Uh, there's somebody, you have had a problem in your, in your, your brain. There's, 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 there's some fluid or something in, in those brain tissues that's not what it's supposed to be, 
and uh, maybe it's encephalitis uh, or something. I don't know what it is, but whatever it is, it's in your brain. Touch your hand over your forehead in the name of Jesus. Be made whole. Touch. And there's someone else. You have, you have a problem where your spinal cord is connecting with your brain stem and all of the, the electronic and electrical signals that are supposed to go through there aren't connecting. But right now, all that scar tissue, all that arthritis, it's gone in Jesus' name. You'll not need Maybe. surgery, nor will you have that ongoing pain in Jesus' name. I think it's Donna that's got, you've got a, a blockage in your intestines. And God is opening that blockage right as we speak. You've been concerned about it. It's not cancer, but the Lord is setting you free in Jesus' name. Now, Lord, all over this audience, people are fearful. We rebuke fear. A perfect love casts out fear, for fear has torment. We do not receive fear. We do not receive the word of the coronavirus epidemic. We do not receive the terror that walks if at night and walks in the, in the noonday. We will not receive it. And Lord, at this moment, we ask for a clear mind, mm -hmm. free of worry, that people will praise God Almighty. And we praise you, Lord, for all of your goodness. And thank you for your answers. Thank you for protecting your people. Thank you for sending a watch over us. Mm -hmm. And in your word, you will protect your people. In Jesus' yes. name, amen. amen. And amen. Give us a call, please, if you've heard something. If the Lord has touched you, you have an answer to prayer. We love to have these and love to share them. Mm -hmm. Okay? Well, still ahead, get your DVRs ready because one of your favorite segments is right around the corner. Your questions with some honest answers. Don says, doesn't the Bible promise believers protection from fatal plagues, traps, and danger in Psalm 91? Find out what Pat has to say. It's later on today's show. And welcome back to the 700 Club for this CBN news break. America's largest Protestant denomination is canceling its annual gathering. The Southern Baptist Convention is not meeting for the first time in 75 years. The SBC posted on its website, we are calling on all Southern Baptists to pray for an end to this global pandemic. This is not a time for Southern Baptists to shrink back. This is not the time to retreat. This is a time for us to advance the gospel of Jesus Christ to every person in every town, every city, every state, and every nation. The event was scheduled for June 9th and 10th in Orlando. Francis Chan is encouraging the church to view the coronavirus pandemic as one of the greatest opportunities to reach the lost. He shared an inspiring video message on his YouTube channel. This is one of our greatest opportunities for reaching out to a lost world and showing them that we haven't lost our love, joy, and peace. Even at this moment, the enemy can't take that away from us. We love the Lord Jesus Christ, and His church is alive and well. Amen. I want to remind you, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website. It's cbnnews.com. Pat and Terry are back with more of today's 700 Club. It's coming up right after this. Well, I'm happy to tell you that you can download the CBN Family app and activate your streaming link when you order I Am Patrick on DVD for your gift of $15 or more. Watch I Am Patrick anywhere, anytime on your television or favorite devices with the CBN Family app. This is the full movie and special features that you would have seen in theaters. So get your DVD of I Am Patrick with instant streaming access today. Just call 1-800-700-7000 or visit CBN.com. You can also text PATRICK to 71777 to order your DVD. Nice to know that's available. You get a full movie. I mean, that's a pretty good Absolutely. deal. <laughs> and you don't have to go to the theater. You don't yeah. have to buy the popcorn and pay all the money and get sick. You can stay home and watch a great movie. Yes. We'll send it to you. Make your own popcorn. <laughs> get your own popcorn. <laughs> Fifteen bucks. That's a pretty good deal. All right. Well, when the housing market crashed, Chris Birch was hit hard. He stopped getting paid and started to feel the pressure. 
Chris could see a financial storm looming on the horizon, but he knew he had a major decision to make. Watch this. As the co-founder of Grand Bay Construction, Chris Birch builds vacation homes and properties across the tourist town of Santa Rosa Beach, Florida. This is a big tourist destination. I had plans to, you know, build a big construction company was my plan. And uh, I had some partners. But within two years, the housing market began to crash. And Chris and his financial partners quickly felt the pressure. Prices in real estate were uh, being dropped and dropped and dropped and dropped. And owners defaulted and couldn't pay us. So we were sort of left um, with a lot of obligations financially that we couldn't keep going. I didn't panic, but it, it, was, uh, it was sort of like, okay, you know, what's going on? You know, look, we got a storm coming. Chris is a Christian and has been a faithful tither since his mid-20s. But with his business struggling, Chris had to decide if he should stop giving. The Lord has taken care of me all these years. Even things have been tight. You know, why would I not trust his word? And why would I just borrow from him or steal from him or whatever you want to say? I'm, uh, and so I said, I'm not going to do that. To show the Lord that I really do believe him and I really trust him, I'm going to actually give more than I'm giving now, even though, again, my income's going down. And it wasn't a lot, but I, this was something I just felt like the Lord said, just, you know, just trust me with this. At the end of 12 months, Chris was amazed at what happened to his finances. I had paid off my graduate school loans, which, which, which was pretty amazing. And I had saved more money in that one year than I had in the previous five years combined. Again, no, God's economy just doesn't work the way ours our does. There's no way I can explain that besides him just saying, you trusted in me and I'm going to provide for you. His construction business survived the recession. In the years since, Chris has seen even more incredible growth. So from those days when we first got started, I mean, I don't know the exact numbers, but I would say we're probably close to almost 10 times um, in volume sales of what we were doing back then. Chris continues to tithe and also gives time and money to ministries that serve those in need, like CBN. Operation Blessing and all those type things, I really believe in those kind of things. I'm trying to do that as well, but I love uh, being part of a bigger organization that's doing those things and is changing the world and bringing light to, to the darkness. He's increased the business, and in turn, we, we take a portion of our business and we turn that back into the kingdom, whether it's buying Bibles or um, we've got uh, mission projects all over the world where we're helping spread the gospel. According to Chris, the key to overcoming financial strain is following God's financial principles. If you do what God asks you to do, He will give you this peace and He will provide a way. Even when, like in my case, there was no way it worked on paper. And all these things that looked horrible, um, I've turned out better. Everything has turned out better. And, and He's proven to me that he, he will take care of me even through those difficult times. I love it. He'll take care of me during those difficult times. He, you know, the thing of it is, when God's doing you, you're not even aware where it's coming from. But Chris wasn't aware, but it was coming anyhow, and before long, his business is 10 times what it was before. He believed God, and God took it from there. Now, folks, if you want to participate in what we're doing around the world, you can be a partner. You can help the poor, the needy, the suffering. You can get the gospel of the four corners of the earth. And what does it take to join the 700 Club? It's just $20 a month, 65 cents a day. Not a whole lot, but that's what will start. Then Chris's case, he kept going up, 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 despite what was going on. And God says, I'm not limited by the business cycle. I'm not limited by the troubles in the stock market. I'm not limited by the slowdown in the construction business. I'm not limited to these things. I am God Almighty. The gold is mine, the silver is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills. He's in charge of everything. It's all his. And what you need to do is trust him and move. Now, for those who join the 700 Club at $20 a month, I want to give you a little book that I wrote recently called The Ten Laws of Success. And it tells about how to have successful family finances and how to win and all these things. I'll give you this book free, and uh, it's available for you. We'll, it's a pretty little book here, and uh, we'll give this to you. And in addition, they want to give you a, a couple chapters of my new book called I Walk with the Living God. It's too big for me to give you the whole thing, but I'll give you two chapters of it. And um, the uh, well, it, it's got the table of contests, and uh, it said... The self soulish man must die, a new thing go and tell. Um, 
And all these things are there for you, like a prairie fire, false shepherds, and true uh, covering. Uh, it, it's quite a book. It's got all kinds of things in it, but it will give you these two chapters as our gift to you. And this will come up. the whole book coming up? Uh, May, the first week of May. Oh, wonderful. Finally, so finally, finally. <laughs> I've been waiting, waiting, waiting. But anyhow, we'll give you this to let you know what's out there. Then you can make your decisions about that. But pick up the phone, call in 1-800-700-7000. Okay? Thank you. Well, up next, time for your questions. <clears throat> Excuse me, and some honest answers. Kavan asks, it's too late for those who are unable to let go of bitterness to be with Jesus, or is it too late? Hang on, Kavan. Pat's going to answer that for you. It's coming up. Well, Easter is almost here. We want you to make this Easter season a memorable one for you and your family. Discover how Easter connects with the Jewish festival of Passover. You know, in this free guide, you're going to see why Jesus is our Passover Lamb of God, and you'll experience the power of His death and resurrection more deeply than ever before. We want you to get your free copy of Passover and Easter, A Divine Connection. To do that, call this toll-free number, 1-800-700-7000, or you can visit at cbn.com slash Passover and Easter. And, you know, we hear so much talk about the blood on the doorpost. We want you to understand all of what the Bible has to say about that. So call us. We'll get it out to you right away. Okay. Time for some questions. You Let's ready? Go for all right. Okay, Pat, the first one comes from Don, who says, doesn't the Bible promise believers protection from fatal plagues, traps, and danger in Psalm 91? By praying this together as a nation, in groups online or individually, could this bring God's hand of healing and protection to people here in America and around the world? Well, we, we could. If you remember of the prayer that they were to pray was, if my people, which are called by my name, will, quote, humble themselves, number one, and pray, number two, and forsake their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will uh, hear their prayers and heal their land. But if there's going to be a, a, a national time when we're free from this kind of stuff, there needs to be a call to humility, confession, forsaking sin, and then prayer. And if we do that, yes, God will hear, okay? This is Kavan who says, it is too late for those, I think he means, is it too late for those who are unable to let go of bitterness to be with Jesus? I'm scared to go to hell. I have felt bitter for a long time now. I keep asking God for his forgiveness and strength to forgive others, but I feel angry. All right. Uh, two things. Number one, um, the God will forgive you all this stuff if you, if you confess it. But look, how do you get, you, you're mad at somebody, you're bitter, and they, they did you in. I mean, they really took you, and, and they, they have humiliated you. They've put you down. You were in school, and they embarrassed you. Uh, you your siblings have turned against you. I mean, you, 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 the whole list of things. But here's the deal. If you want to get free from bitterness, you don't sit around saying, I want to get rid of bitterness, because all that does is magnify the bitterness. What you start doing is saying, God, I want you to bless those people that hurt me. I want to bless my enemies. I want to bless those that did this terrible thing to you. God, bless them. So all of a sudden, you're asking God to look after those people. Instead of focusing in on that bitterness, you're focusing on, on, on blessing to the others. And as you give forth that blessing, you are set free. That's what you want to do, all right? This is Gertie Pat, who says, when we accept Jesus as our Savior, we are forgiven all our sins, past, present, future. So if or when I sin now, do I ask him to cleanse me of it through his blood, or do I just admit I did wrong and repent of it? I'm hearing different things, and I'm a little confused. Well, look, if you, if you read, uh, I think it's uh, the little letter of, of third, uh, third John, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ continually cleanses us from all sin, continuously cleanses us from all sin, then if we say we have not sinned, we make God a liar, and his truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So uh, 
I think it was John Wesley that said, there's not a day that doesn't go by that I don't plead the blood of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Because as we walk with the Lord, well, there are things coming up in our lives. But if we walk as He is in the light, and we continuously do it, the blood will continuously cleanse us. That's what the Bible says, all right? Mm -hmm. This is Wendy who says, Hello, Pat. I'm from Alaska, and I recently started watching The 700 Club. I'd like to start tithing, but only my husband is working right now. If I get a job, my top priority is to tithe. How much are we supposed to give back? If it's 10%, do we both give the required percentage, or can it be combined because we're married? <laughs> you know, I, I tell you what, God is not a Philadelphia lawyer, nor is he an accountant. He's not got a ledger to count up all your, your giving. But the normal thing is a tithe of, of that which he has blessed you with, and you give to the, unto the work of the Lord. And I think if it's two of you, uh, and it's a family, you give as a family. So you combine, if you make 50000 a year and your husband makes sixty, or the other way around, it's 110, so you tithe that. That's what I would think you would do. You wouldn't take one single salary and not mm -hmm. tie the other. But what, the, the main thing is you want to be blessed. And God says, prove me with your tithes and offerings. If I want to open the windows of heaven and pour you such a blessing, you can't contain it. So the idea is how many opportunities do I have to give so that God will pour out a blessing on me? Mm -hmm. All right? Okay, this is Dolores who says, when you have so many health problems and you pray for healing and others are praying for you and you never get an answer, are you doing something wrong? Uh, it's entirely possible. Look at your heart. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord won't hear me. If I have bitterness, the Bible says, when you stand praying, if you have ought against any, forgive, but your heavenly Father may forgive you. If you want to be in a position of being born again, of being uh, access to the throne of God, you have to let go of bitterness. So you may have a resentment against your, your parents. You may have a resentment against your spouse. You, you, who knows what's in your heart? But get rid of that. If you, when you stay in praying, if you have ought against any, forgive. That's the answer. All right, last thing. Dave wants to know where in Scripture it says men shouldn't wear jewelry. He says, I wear a wedding band and one other ring and a bracelet. I'm not allowed to wear them if preaching or teaching at the church I attend. Is this scriptural? And if so, where can I find it? Uh, if you can find it, you're better than I am. I don't know where it is. <laughs> That's important. So. I tell you, some of these churches set up artificial barriers. And, you know, I think what God's looking for is our heart. You know, those that worship God must worship Him in spirit and truth. God is a spirit. He isn't interested in, in your jewels and that kind of stuff. It's what's in your heart. Are you wearing that stuff to show off? I've got a super gold Rolex that costs 20 grand. I mean, is that what you're wearing it for? You're wearing a wedding ring because you show you're married? That, that's okay. Well, today's prayer minute from Psalm 91 was, Long life I will satisfy Him and show Him my salvation.